Hi everyone, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for the final migration seminar of this academic year. Uh, my name is Laura Kletton. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the United Nations University Merit, and I'm convening this seminar series on behalf of UNU Merit uh, and Maastricht University in the Netherlands. The migration seminar series invites researchers, practitioners, but also policymakers and others to discuss their work uh, related to migration in one capacity or the other. And so before I'll introduce today's speaker to you, um, there's some brief housekeeping that I need to do first. Our speaker's talk uh, today will last for approximately 30 to 40 minutes, um, after which we'll have, of course, time for questions uh, and discussions. Um, I would like to ask you to keep your questions until after the speaker is done with their presentation. And you can either put a question in the chat, um, and then I'll make sure to read it out loud for you, or you can use ask the question yourself um, by clicking the raise your hand um, button uh, on Zoom, and I'll then allocate turns. But please, in the meantime, uh, keep your microphones muted. And your camera, as I said, can be turned on, but please be aware that we are recording the seminar for today for distribution on our YouTube channel later on. And on the YouTube channel, you can also find recordings of previous migration seminars uh, that we held past years. So now let me introduce our speaker um, for you. We're very happy to welcome um, Dr. Rafaela Schweiger, who is currently the director of the migration program at the Robert Bush Stiftung. I hope that that's the correct pronunciation. Um, where she leads uh, on global migration governance, climate mobility, uh, the protection of refugees and migrants, cities and the intersection between technological change and migration. She holds a doctorate from the University of Erlangen Nuremberg, and she's also a 2023 Yale World Fellow. Um, but today um, she'll be talking to us about her new book and her take on the evolution and future of global migration governance. So in the book, she investigates the role and the influence of non-state actors and local authorities in processes leading up to the adoption of the 2018 Global Compact for Migration. Um, but I'm, uh, I'm sure that she can introduce all of this way better herself. Um, so without further ado, Rafaela, I would love to give you the floor. Um, thanks so much for being here today and looking forward to your talk. Thanks um, so much, Laura, and uh, hi, everyone. Good to um, see you and see some, some familiar faces, but also a lot of new faces. Um, as Laura said, my name is Rafaela, uh, Rafaela Schweiger. Um, I work at the Robert Bosch Foundation, where we do lots of things on, on global migration issues, but um, there's also an academic life where I try to keep things separate. So, so this is really the, the academic uh, side of me who um, sharing my findings from from the book, I'm going to pull up the presentation and we tested that um, just a minute ago. And now, sorry about that. Um, this is gone, the second screen. I'm going to test that again. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to speak about, um, do you see it, Laura? Can you quickly jump in, in the right way? You're muted. It's not full screen yet, but we do see the full screen. If you get what I mean. I'm very sorry. We just tested it before. Um, but I think if you, I think it would work. Um, let me pull it up again. Give me one second. Sorry. Don't worry. Don't worry. So okay. Now you should see it in a minute. Looks perfect. Okay. okay. There we go. Um, so um, I'm here in my hat as an academic speaking about the book that is titled um, Beyond States. Um, and uh, I really looked into the question of how actors other than states and local authorities manage to influence or not influence at a certain degree the global compact for migration and what that actually means for, for today. So I'm gonna talk about um, uh, a number of things. I want to remind everyone again about what the Global Compact for Migration is and why I believe it's really a landmark agreement that we should keep working on and that we should keep investing in. Um, I also want to speak about why I think that non-state actors and local authorities were relevant to the Global Compact and how and how 
I would actually argue we can measure their influence and, and the methodology behind it. And then really looking into the findings of um, what I could trace um, for the research and for the book in terms of finding influence and the learnings from that. And finally, what it all means for today's um, and the future of global migration governance. So I know that uh, many of you are, are, are working on this. Um, as, a, as a reminder, Global Compact for Migration was adopted um, in 2018. It was the really first intergovernmentally negotiated agreement that was prepared um, under the auspices of the United Nations um, covering many aspects of international migration and human mobility. Um, so it actually brought the one of the last outstanding issues um, uh, into the UN system. It consists of 23 self-commitments um, of, of states. And we have a review of the compact every four years. The first one happened last year in May in New York. And it actually sits in, in a very long continuum. And I know that Elaine worked a lot on that. And I, I drew a lot of learnings um, for my research, also from Elaine's uh, book, um, on, on the emergence of, of the global migration governance and specifically looking at um, this timeline between 2015 and 2018, where a lot changed. Um, and where um, the, the many crises or the perceived crises that were happening around migrants, migration and refugees um, during that time led to significant changes um, in, in the UN system and, and opportunities and opportunity structures actually opening, opening up, meaning we had the 2016 New York Declaration that then agreed on the adoption of the, uh, the development of a global compact for migration and a global compact on refugees. The latter one I'm not going to talk about. Um, it's also very important, but I focused on the, the migration aspect. And I think when we look at the DCM and what it really did in terms of changing international cooperation on migration, um, we found a really a new common language and a reference point for global migration that is that can be used even more, but it is used a lot already. Um, we have seen the creation of a new and common infrastructure on the issue. IOM joined the UN system. We have a UN migration network that is that is established to coordinate the whole ecosystem. Um, uh, including UN agencies, government, civil society, and many other actors on uh, migration. We have new mechanisms for review, follow-up, and implementation that engage states, that engage all the other actors. And we have new funding mechanisms with the Migration Multipartner Trust Fund um, that is there to implement um, the DCM and where, where governments put money down for it, um, not funding goal not achieved, but it's there as an instrument. And it's also a bit of a playing field with almost a toolbox of ideas that are implemented and tested on several levels of governance in different regions of the world that have been proposed as objectives or subsequent items in the negotiations. And finally, and that is what I'm gonna um, focus on is um, it was a moment where non-state actors, and I really mean broad, range of actors from uh, civil society, the private sector, trade unions, academia, and so, so many more. And local authorities put themselves very prominently on the radar to be key actors in um, both the development, but also then the implementation of the, of the global compact and global migration governance um, more broadly. And you might also recall a bit the, the political tension that we've seen uh, between, and I put here a photo from the wall of the Intergovernmental Conference in December 2018 in Marrakesh, um, when we've seen, uh, when we had a gap between the, the end of the negotiations in July and the actual adoption. Um, so, so there were there, there were very a lot of political tensions. Um, coming up during that phase, which really weakened um, the, the significance of the compact, which also I think a lot of governments learned from, hopefully. 
Um, but also during the process, we've seen um, several moments that were very, very critical. First, when the U US administration under Trump announced it would leave the process actually before the negotiations um, actually started. And I would argue we wouldn't have a compact as it is today if the Trump administration had been part of the actual negotiations. And then we saw governments um, falling over the pact. Um, the Belgian government, Jean Michel, at the time as prime minister, fell over the vote on the DCM. The Swiss, who co facilitated the, 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 the text um, over national controversies, didn't adopt the compact and haven't done so um, ever since. So, so I think. Um, well, that shows how how politically tense um, the the compact was and and still is. If you look at um, if we look at how, which governments are committed, how many efforts are governments putting into that. So I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's it's the first um, it's the first UN holistic document and agreement on migration. So it's really worthwhile looking into it also through research and for actors other than states to engage in those processes. And coming a bit to how the process looked like, and this is important for um, assessing how influential actors other than states can be, is that we've seen that the process was structured in three phases. First consultations that happened um, in 2017, that was actually quite a long phase, um, where actors were consulted extensively, a very short stock taking where governments and those actors came together um, before it actually came to the intergovernmental negotiations that were quite short and quite intense in, in timing. So I asked in my um, in my um, research how influential were non-state actors and local authorities in the development of the global compact for um, safe, orderly, and regular migration. You can break that down into a lot of sub questions, and I just briefly want to mention um, that I worked with a uh, um, with uh, the concept of Betzel and Corel. They put forward in two thousand and one and adapted it because also many other methodologies um, arose ever since on with the principle of um, we need to look at, at several dimensions um, if we want to measure influence. Um, so not only what did actors transmit, but also how did other actors um, behave and take that on. So really taking on a 360 degree approach and that is very much methodology that is very technical, but that has been used for the assessment um, and analysis of global climate negotiations, where we've seen a lot of research being done on, on these questions since the early 2000s, increasingly also more on the human rights field. And to my assessment, very little or in, in, in different um, forms and um, in, in the migration space. So, so I think the, the Global Compact is also a good moment to do a bit of a baseline analysis. And that methodology also was very much used to, uh, to look at, at one particular actor. I did it very broadly and I looked at the broad scope of actors with various um, tools like surveys and, and uh, numerous interviews and document analysis. I'm happy to answer questions later on um, uh, around this. So I want to move us a bit um, to the, the, the findings and um, the critical role that I mentioned of this phase one, the consultation phase, when it comes to non-state actors, all kinds. Um, so in, in my research, I was um, really able to show that in particular, non-state actors were able to contribute their ideas, their expertise and their input during that consultation and also the stock taking, which was set up in a way um, that was very participatory. And I could show through my data that the process, this first phase significantly influenced um, the first draft of the Global Compact. And what happened then during the negotiations is that the, the draft stayed more or less with changes with objectives that have been 
added, but nothing really was taken out. Some language was weakened. Um, so that, that first phase was, was very, very critical. And the reason for this, um, from, from my perspective, was the openness of the co-facilitators. That was Mexico and Switzerland, who very, very closely worked with civil society, private sector, other experts, um, um, who really brought technical, academic input um, from the field, from, from all spheres. And they read it all. They went through it, they structured it, and they put it in, in one very coherent document. And actually, especially civil society and others were positively surprised by the zero draft. And were then a bit astonished of, okay, how do we deal actually with this um, going into, um, into the, the consultation phase? And I think um, other tools they really used and were very successful, and I'm going to come back to that, is working in in coalitions, in multi-stakeholder alliances, those were the issues, if they were bundled and very broadly being put forward to governments, to the co-facilitators that really landed um, in the global compact. So I wanna um, show a bit more um, concretely how, um, what are examples for successes and failures and losses during the negotiations and, for those who haven't done so, it's really worthwhile going through the, the global compact and see what's in there. And I think there are very, very clear successes of a concept that's called the Global Skills Partnerships that many of you might know that has been introduced during the consultation. It stayed in the document, minor text edits, but it was ta taken as an idea um, and, and carried throughout the, the negotiations with very clear, effective advocacy and asks. I would also argue that the issue of child rights, um, which was very much developed through, through a multi-stakeholder coalition, um, especially when focused on alternatives to detention was a key um, success, um, also in the way of how civil society worked with governments with international organizations, um, other non-governmental partners to really push for that issue. Um, and the, the major losses and disappointments include above all the human rights based and international law concepts and terminologies um, that in, still were part of the zero draft in many ways um, that were taken out or very much weakened during the um, during the negotiations, um, such as no reformant, which is there as a as a as as international law. Um, it's not in the compact by this terminology. It's it's a it's a weaker wording, um, and firewalls, which is um, intended as a principle to ensure that when basic social rights are claimed, um, uh, data is not being shared with immigration or authorities. Um, and that is something that uh, the states didn't agree on. So um, I think <clears throat> that is just gives a, it's a bit of a feeling there, there are so many more examples, but for me, those are the most outstanding ones um, uh, in terms of, um, uh, how how the actors um, worked, and when it came to the negotiations for for the broad and the broad field of civil society, and I'm very much generalizing here, um, is they had their entry point to through the co-facilitators and a number of friendly governments. Um, the majority of governments really didn't show up and didn't show any interest in what. Um, these actors had to say. Um, and that was uh, even more important to work through their entry points in the system they had. Um, and the actual negotiations, because things went very fast, you had to be constantly in New York, um, was, I would call it a playing field of very experienced, but also very actors that had the financial means. Um, uh, from civil society and others who could actually do that. Um, and still the field uses the DCM as an advocacy tool and, and there's a high identification that it could show from the survey that I did with the field. And then 
I would always say cities um, who you now, you see them in global migration fora, global migration processes, um, as they're just there. Um, you, you cannot think about the system without mayors um, speaking up, sharing their perspectives. Um, when the process started, there were very much new actors. There was a lot of work done in the past preparing the field. Um, but they were really a similar um, but very different case when it came to the global compact for migration process. So during, you remember again, phase one, two, three of, of, of the, the development of the global compact, during phase one, the consultations, cities weren't represented. There were one or two showing up at, at some meetings, speaking there, um, but they really in the back, what we know now is, is organize themselves to visibly participate in the stock taking and ask to be included in the negotiations and more strongly in, in, in migration governance and have prepared um, their way. And they were very active actually during the negotiation process. So we had prior to 2017, and it was even until 20. 18, 19, very weak structures for city diplomacy um, in the migration field. And cities and, and mayors had allies in the UN system. They had allies in the co-facilitators to really wanting to bring them on board. Um, and in order to work throughout the negotiations phase, they um, went organized in very informal city networks. So that was not represented no, no organization who would actually do it. And what gave city engagement really a push was the, again, the US withdrawal, because the message then was the US government is out, but US cities are in. We really wanna, um, wanna show that this issue is important to us. And it's also a bit of a working, working on international issues um, uh, against uh, the, the national government. And they came in as a very fresh, new, pragmatic perspective. And I think they are they are to date. Um, but when it comes to looking at actually, did they influence the process? Um, I would say their success really lies in the specification of their role as local authorities. So they had strong advocacy around they're not local actors, they're they're not part of civil society, they are different. Um, and they want to have that specified in the text and they managed to, and you can see that throughout the different drafts of the global compact. And it was a strong contribution to keep one particular object objective, which is a very important one on access to basic services in the document when the negotiations really were short of, you know, let's take that out. We cannot work with that. We cannot agree to that. They had very little influence on actually the negotiated text um, and, uh, and the zero draft as, um, as civil society and, and many other non-state non actors. Um, and there were at that time hardly any existing networks and contacts between cities and the UN system. Cities came in for many of the governments. It were very surprising that they were there, but then um, uh, they worked with it and it, it did something to them also in their perspective, per perception. Um, and cities today have a very high identification with the global compact. We now have a mayor's mechanism established um, that works both with the Global Forum on Migration and Development, the, the, the UN system um, on, on so many ways. And there is a mayor's migration council as an actual city diplomacy vehicle um, that was established after the adoption of the global compact. So that was their leverage um, to really become an established actor in the system and fighting to be even more recognized. So I briefly want to um, share some, some learnings um, on what, what made actors successful. And many of many actors who were involved were wouldn't say they were successful. They would be, be we learned a lot. Um, what our organization or what we personally can contribute and what not. Um, but there are four points that I really that I want to share. 
like the clearer the goal and the mandate of, of an actor, the more targeted they could actually be in the process. So if you were strictly working on alternatives to detention, you could be very focused on one objective and go through with it um, uh, during the negotiations versus when you had 10, 15 issues and didn't really know, and if you're talking about everything and nothing, um, that really didn't come across with um, diplomats. Um, you needed actually a lot of experience and knowledge and network in the UN system to, to make your way through um, to be actually, if you're talking about influencing um, such a process. Um, uh, otherwise, you would have been lost in such a also hard timed process um, with so many people and actors involved. The less dogmatic um, actors presented themselves, the more credible they, they were regarded by diplomats. So coming back to the question of um, how much expertise um, they can bring, they could really help governments to sort some of the things out because they didn't really know what it meant during the negotiations. Um, but that posed often a challenge to a very diverse cohort of civil society who, who wouldn't want to be that pragmatic. Um, and rightly so. So that that's um, so. So my my question is always, how do you become more influential, and how could you actually influence the process for the findings? And and then coming back to um, alliances, um, uh, coalitions, they were perceived as more credible and relevant by diplomats who were negotiating during during the process, especially if there were a few governments part of, of such a coalition who would step up for child rights, um, et cetera. And um, yeah, that's that's some of the key learning. So so when it, when I have if I would have to pull it down to three things, um, I would argue there were in 2015 onwards so many opportunity structures um, for the involvement and the access of actors other than states and cities to the UN system on migration issues a lot open up with still a number of challenges that we can talk about but it was really really a moment and opportunities that came out of the political system and many of them used it well others couldn't do it in, in such a short amount of time and the space for civil society is also closing um, more over the last few years. And we had this clear influence of the zero draft that I could show um, uh, in my research, which speaks to processes have to be inclusive and they have to find, find an approach that is, that is accessible, um, that bring people's expertise and perspectives in. And it was the case in the baseline for the further engagement of, of cities and mayors in global migration uh, governance. So just a quick um, uh, reminder and, and illustration of the governance system, how it looks like today. Um, that's a lot. Um, and, and we didn't cut anything out to what was there pre-2015. Um, so there is still a global forum on migration and development. There is um, technically still a high level dialogue on migration and development. There are all the UN agencies who deal very prominently and sometimes cross cutting with migration. And what came on top is a UN migration network coordinated by IOM who works with all the stakeholders. Um, there is the the International Migration Review Forum taking place every four years, and there's a global refugee forum. And for many of the non-state actors, the cities, the mayors, they go to all of these. Um, and it's a very extensive, um, extensive work to be done with, that needs a lot of resources. And the same is for, for governments. And, and actually the question of what is discussed where um, will come up more and more. And we will see that at the Global Refugee Forum, we will see it at the DFMD, um, the climate migration, also a lot of a lot is spoken about at the, the climate processes. Um, so it's getting increasingly complex and to be sorted out um, how, how things um uh, should be and how actors other than states can be involved in such processes. 
And a quick recap on the first review of the Global Compact for, for Migration, which took place um, a good year ago in New York. Um, and from, from my take, um, I think it was three issues that were high up on the agenda. Uh, one is climate migration, um, very broadly migrants in vulnerable situations, and the meaningful participation um, of non-governmental actors, which from my perspective hasn't been really achieved because of the COVID and visa issues, but also the, the setup of, of the forum. What was not discussed there is um, the consequences of Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Um, because it's a migration and not a refugee forum, a few governments mention it, that it's missing from the agenda and from the conversations. Um, but that also speaks to the, the graph that I showed was like where, is, where we discuss what and what when are the right moments to speak about what um, that adds to the complexity. So I'm going to move to the last um, bit of the presentation, um, which is uh, my recommendations and takeaways. And also because we're in a, in a group of academics, some research ideas and research outlook um, that I identified in, in, um, uh, based on what I did. So when it comes to um, the recommendations and they're on, on very different levels, what I really could take out of my, my research is um, with every process that we have at the UN is the, the negotiation of how actors other than states and cities will be included is renegotiated. That takes a lot of effort and time and, and um, expert entities from, from those different uh, constituencies to fight for the inclusion and being heard and being thought into the process. So I really believe, and, and uh, it's politically a, a difficult time for that, but that the UN system needs to establish a more systematic and institutional roles for, for those um, actors. Um, I spoke a lot about those multi-stakeholder alliances. I really believe that um, we need much more of those in the space to be actually influential and, and um, uh, bring issues onto the table, also unusual coalitions. Um, and um, that relates to the third point. I found in my research that most of the actor groups, also private sector and civil society and civil society in cities, they were so busy with their own 10 people they would be working with they really didn't manage to look left and right, um, understandably so. And I think um, things have changed, but um, also there, the, the cooperation and the, the, the collaboration can, can be um, way improved. Um, also, again, with the perspective of, can we be more influential in bringing our perspective into that compl complicated system? Um, <clears throat> there were only a few countries um, or even local contacts where during such a negotiation it was connected with the national and, and local level where input was brought up and the other way around. A few countries had national consultations, but it wasn't um, the standard. Um, civil society did some regional consultations and I heard a lot also from, from the interviewees that I spoke with that this is something that also the UN system has to do more broadly when it comes to those critical issues of being, re being relevant and getting in the input um, of other communities than the usual ones that we would see at the UN. Resources was a big issue, it still is. Um, as a civil society organization, how do you decide um, whether you send someone into the field working with migrants and refugees? or sending someone to New York to spend a few months um, really working on one item in one negotiated document. And um, the UN system itself is not providing significant resources um, for that um, to do so, sometimes through some international organizations, but it's very little. Um, I did my research during COVID. There was a lot of excitement um, in my survey and the interviews about the virtual opportunities because that made it easier 
for people to attend meetings, to bring their input. Um, on the other hand, one of the key findings is you need the personal connection and the networks in the system and you don't make them through through the virtual meeting. So it's it's a bit of a balance and and I think something to to think about um, also for, for the system going forward, how to purposefully use those, um, the, those different meeting formats. And then as a last point, and that is really something towards um, everyone outside of the governmental system, I heard a lot of stories of what stuck with diplomats in terms of um, stories, expertise that was shared. And it were those stories that came from unusual groups, from affected communities themselves, that were presented in a different way, not the usual UN language. And um, I think that is really something for for such meetings and for such interventions that actors can really um, use uh, going forward. Um, and when it comes to further research, just a few um, thoughts and, and proposals. I think we see very little clarification and understanding of the different roles and types of actors. So is academia part of civil society or is it actually an own constituency? Um, what's the distinct role of local authorities in the international system? There are so many things to be solved also for how the UN technically um, looks at those, those groups and, and constituencies, but also for, for research to, to much um, closer look at this. And then I found a lot of stories where it was actually individuals um, who had a huge impact on changes in the international system through their personal networks, through their commitment, um, etc. And we don't really have, um, at least in political science and international relations, um, good enough explanations for that, I would say. So there's surely something that I would um, consider um, looking into more and, and catching up a bit on this. Um, what I haven't done, what I would like to do in the future, um, but also think it could be interesting for others, is comparing those findings with other pol policy fields, such as climate, such as human rights, how actors actually behave and move. We have we see a lot of similar patterns around um, coalition building, around uh, shaming and blaming strategies that, that we know, but actually with the work that I've done, there hasn't been a comparison that happened so far. Um, there's some things written um, about COVID and, and actually what, what that meant for migration governance and, and, and the changes um, there. I think there's, there's a lot of interesting work that could be done around that. Um, the whole doing similar things and, and refining the methodology and the finding around the implementation review and follow up. I'm not doing it. Um, so, so I think there is lots of opportunity also looking into the IMRF, the progress declaration, um, the, the changes in the setup of the UN migration network um, where researchers could look into if they're interested in um, in the role of non-state actors and, and cities in the space. And then I also mentioned, um, you know, what does actually such big changes as Russia's invasion in Ukraine mean for migration and refugee governance? And where do we actually speak about what and, and how is it this, this fragmentation that we see of where issues are being discussed? With that, I'm going to close and very much uh, looking forward to the questions and the discussions. Thank you so much.